Hi, my name is Ankit Gupta, and I, I welcome you all on behalf of IntelliCap and Sankalp Global Summit to the session on climate risk mainstreaming the roadmap for financial institutions in India. Uh, the session will be moderated by Mr. Pustav Joshi, who is the Associate Director, Clean Energy Finance at Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, and will join by the esteemed guest, which he will also introduce shortly to all of you. I just want to quickly share the agenda for today. We'll have an uh, initial 10-minute context setting by Pustav Joshi, uh, who is the moderator of the session, and uh, he will set the context on the very important topic on climate risk mainstreaming for financial institutions in India. It will be followed by 50 minutes to one hour panel discussion with three esteemed guests, uh, which we will introduce shortly. After that, we'll have a 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A and open discussions, all of you. So who, uh, if you have any questions, suggestions on the topic and want to discuss anything with the panelists, please feel free to drop your chat uh, uh, suggestions and comments in the chat window. And we'll ensure that we'll take all those comments and suggestions towards the end and we'll discuss them with the panelists here. And then we'll have a five minutes of closing remarks from all the panelists, as well as from Pustav uh, on the overall session. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, to join again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. And without further ado, I would like to pass on the mic to Pustav to take it forward from here. Thank you, Ankit. Um, let me start by welcoming the panelists and today's audience uh, to the session on climate risk mainstreaming, the roadmap for financial institutions in India. The panelists for today's session are uh, Itzka Lulov, Director at Triodos Investment Management Netherlands. Itzka is an entrepreneurial networker with 20 years of experience in sustainable banking and impact investing. With a passion for energy transition in the Netherlands, Europe and emerging, emerging markets of Asia and Africa. She joined Triodos Investment Management in 2010, where she managed the Triodos Growing Funds TGF, investing in senior debt for pro projects in the Dutch renewable energy, organic agriculture, and sustainable building sectors. Uh, my second panelist is Marcus Wimmer, director at Standard Chartered Bank Germany. Marcus has 11 plus years of experience across this full spectrum of enterprise risk management, as well as treasury management within globally operating banks. Together with his team, he is currently building up the ERM function for Standard Chartered Bank in Germany, France, and Sweden as part of the Brexit preparations. My third panelist is Dr. Alok Mishra, CEO, Emthin India. Dr. Alok Mishra is the CEO and director at Emthin India, an industry association for microfinance, and an RBI recognized self-regulatory organization. He has over 28 years of experience and has worked globally across 22 countries with premier institutions like NABARD, NCDEX, MCRIL, and MDI. He has provided consulting to ADB, UNCBF, World Bank, IFC, IDLO, Rabobank, amongst others. I will let the panelists introduce themselves and their organization as we turn to them individually during the discussion. However, before we begin today's discussion, I would like to take this opportunity to thank IntelliCap and the Avishkar Group for hosting this extremely important discussion at this year's Sankal Global Summit. Finally, before we dive into the session, some housekeeping guidelines for the session. The session is divided practically into four parts. Each panelist will have an initial five minutes to introduce themselves and their work. Next, we shall circle back to our panelists for a more in-depth discussion where the panelists will speak and share their experience with regards to climate risk mainstreaming and the lessons which we can learn in India. During the following 15 to 20 minutes, we will take questions from the audience and we shall finally conclude with a short summary of and takeaways from the session. To all those listening in, please feel free to post your questions in the chat box at any time during the session. Please do indicate which of the panelists, if any, your question is directed to, and please also mention the name of your company and organization that you represent. To open our discussions today, let me begin by introducing myself. For those of you who don't know me, I am Pustav Joshi, Associate Director at Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. Shakti is India's leading philanthropic not-for-profit in the climate and clean energy space. We focus on supporting a network of partners to deliver policy and ecosystem level solutions, and particularly for climate and energy transition challenges in India. What we do is we work closely with 
to policy makers, industry bodies, think tanks, and civil society organizations, as well as research and consulting groups. To find policy solutions to India's climate and energy transition issues. Personally, I lead the clean energy and clean energy finance and climate and business programs at Shakti. My work focuses on two very important facets with regard to climate change and finance in India. On the one hand, my work focuses on financing green. That is, how do we increase investment flows in India towards clean energy infrastructure, such as renewable energy, energy storage, energy efficiency in industries and buildings, and sustainable transport? On the other hand, and more relevant to today's discussion, I focus on what we call greening finance, which covers corporate climate action and mainstreaming climate risk assessment and pricing in the Indian financial sector. We all know that the Indian economy has incurred over some USD $80 billion in economic losses over the last two decades or so uh, due to the devastating impacts of climate change. I believe something like almost $40 billion was lost in the year 2018 alone. And this year alone, uh, you know, while the COVID crisis has rightly dominated the headlines, uh, India has seen two major cyclones, one on each coast. Uh, in fact, one of them has, is called a, the first super cyclone since uh, the Orissa super cyclone in the 90s. And we've had a major locust attack, uh, which has spread to uh, many parts of North and Central India. Given this sort of backdrop, um, we at Shakti firmly believe that the financial sector uh, in India really needs to uh, reassess its risk assessment and risk pricing frameworks. I think there are two or three reasons why we need to do this uh, reassessment. Firstly, and probably more directly, uh, it is the risk climate change poses uh, to any investors and their assets. Um, the physical risk from increased frequency or an increased severity of extreme weather phenomenon such as cyclones, cloud bursts, flash floods, drought, amongst others, uh, can hardly be ignored. The second is obviously the transition risk, uh, often denoted through you know uh, this proxy of carbon price, but you know carbon price doesn't really. Uh, express that very well. Um, to be uh, to to elaborate a little bit uh, by transition risk, uh, I mean the risk that businesses face to their business models as a result of increasing government policy and regulatory action to try and combat climate change, as well as the the risk businesses now face from changing consumer preferences for their products as society in general on a whole becomes more climate conscious. The second reason for, or the third reason for such a reassessment uh, is linked to these couple of first reasons as well. Um, as asset managers and investors, you know, uh, it is considered prudent for us to invest in a manner that maximizes a return for the longest period possible. Uh, by investing in climate mitigation and green technologies and, in, and infrastructure today, um, we are not only able to balance the overall climate risk in our current portfolios, but also the alignment with say a 1.5 degree scenario or an even better a net zero scenario allows us to substantially reduce the climate risks that increase every year with every ton of CO2 that is em emitted. In light of these, Shakti has taken several initiatives for greening finance. One of them is we're supporting the uh, science-based targets incubator, which helps corporates in India set targets to align their operations with a 1.5 degree world and then build the capacity towards achieving those targets. We've also recently undertaken a study on the adoption of the TCFD framework in India and what amount of um, 
existing disclosures by the top 100 Indian corporates under uh, BRR and other reporting regimes already aligns them with TCFD. If you're interested in the study, the findings are available on uh, Shakti's website. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, that's sh shaktifoundation.in. Um, but most importantly in this area and, and very relevant to this uh, st uh, discussion is uh, a study that we supported in, in which we have supported IntelliCap uh, to study the current level of climate risk assessment and pricing practices amongst financial institutions in India. Um, th this study is also available online on Shakti's website. Uh, however, to just give you a snippet of it, what we found was that most financial institutions in India, uh, and we did study a very large number of financial in institutions across the spectrum, um, commercial banks, microfinance institutions, uh, PE and VC funds, even some insurance companies. What we found that most of the institutions had very little to no awareness of this concept of climate risk, even though some in some way, they already admitted that it is affecting their portfolios some way or the other, at least a little bit, uh, somehow. Let alone, you know, assessing and pri pricing climate risk. Many institutions actually did not even clearly know what it is. Um, well, I think some had some, some had no idea. Some were confused with this general risk related to environment clearances and climate risk and they, they sort of confuse between environment and climate and uh, uh, that sort of thing. So, so they would say, oh, we've gotten pollution certificates, but that's not uh, really dealing with climate risk. Uh, some of them had said they'd heard of the concept, but you know, even the few who said, yes, we do understand there is climate risk uh, and climate risk is important primarily limited themselves to simple sort of insurable risks such as flood, and that too primarily with regard to their agricultural portfolio. And so that's what we found in the study. And, and, and it, it's that kind of findings that has led us to sort of double down and, and uh, uh, you know, look forward to work more in this area of climate risk in India. Uh, and, and Shakti will continue to uh, grow its portfolio of work in, in climate risk in India with regards to financial institutions. Um, because climate risk is real, climate risk is here. Um, floods don't just affect agricultural output. They inundate small and medium factories, which are often in the supply chain of larger businesses. They, they disrupt supply chains, logistics, Floods and cyclones affect real estate investments too. The increased damage from these floods and cyclones may not always get covered under existing insurance policies. In fact, from what we've seen today, many of the premiums which businesses pay on their uh, insurance policies are based on historical calculations of severity and frequency of uh, what we call extreme weather events. Uh, they do not account for the increasing severity and the increasing frequency of these extreme weather events due to climate change. This will affect the risk and returns profile of all these investments. Um, thus, the topic of today's discussion is now more important than ever. We will listen to uh, the global experience on understanding and engaging with the topic of climate risk with from Itska and Marcus. We will also hear about the Indian experience from Dr. Mishra. My co-panelists will also bring in their perspectives from the specific areas they deal with, such as equity, debt, and other facets related to climate risk measurement uh, framework and what the lessons are that we here in India can learn from them. In case you've joined us a little late, uh, I welcome you again. Uh, the topic is climate risk mainstreaming, the roadmap for financial institutions in India. And the speakers on this panel today are uh, Itzka Lulov, Director at Chodos Investment Management Netherlands, Marcus Wimmer, Director at uh, Standard Chartered Bank Germany, and Dr. Alok Mishra, CEO, Ensign India.
Um, as our pa panelists speak, please post your questions along with your name and the name of your organizations in the chat box. Um, so without further delay, uh, I welcome my first panel, Itzka Lulov, uh, Director at uh, Triodos Investment Management. Itzka, uh, diving right in, um, could you tell us a little bit more about your work at Triodos and how is climate risk mainstreaming being considered by uh, private equity investors globally? And if there are any sort of maybe marquee initiatives in this regard in your perspective. Um, okay. uh, request you to keep it uh, brief. We'll circle back to you and we'll have a far more in-depth uh, discussion. Definitely. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. I will try to be brief uh, uh, indeed. Um, um, I work for Triodos Investment Management. Uh, which is a 100% daughter of the Triodos Bank uh, Group. The Triodos Bank Group was founded uh, 40 years ago. So this year we have an anniversary and with the goal really uh, to um, uh, invest in sustainable initiatives only. So uh, offer financing and also invest in sustainable uh, initiatives. It is a European uh, bank group uh, active around uh, the globe. Uh, Triodos Investment Management um, has uh, approximately 5 billion assets under management. We focus on impact investing exclusively. Um, and approximately of this 5 billion, we have 3 billion uh, invested in uh, listed uh, uh, companies and approxi approximately 2 billion in private debt and equity uh, investments. And that is the department uh, that I am heading. Within private debt and equity, uh, we have basically three transition themes that we focus on historically. Um, one of them is financial inclusion. And in that light, we are also a very active investor in microfinance institutions in emerging markets, including in, uh, in India. Another <clears throat> important theme, transition theme, is really focusing on the energy transition, climate uh, uh, issues. Um, and the food uh, transition and to come to a more sustainable uh, food um, uh, system worldwide. Um, by default, we invest in positive contribution. So we have an exclusion list, what we do not invest in. So we really contribute in the positive uh, contribution, focusing on those investments that um, at least do not do damage and hopefully also increase uh, or improve um, uh, the, the transition to a more uh, just, a more inclusive and a more um, green uh, uh, future. We actually also see that every financing has an impact, whether it's a negative impact, a positive impact, but every financing has its impact. Therefore, we also say we do not only um, uh, finance the change, but we also want to change the finance, the, the change the financial sector. And um, in that light, um, I've been closely involved together with several colleagues of Triodos Bank in the establishment of the so-called climate agreement in the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, the government invited several NGOs, corporates and governmental uh, authorities to come up with a climate agreement in line with the Paris goals. And um, there were several um, uh, so-called um, um, uh, yeah, uh, groups working on different themes, for example, on the energy supply or on the agriculture sector or on the built environment sector. And I was in the uh, sector uh, on uh, the financial institutions. So how can financial institutions contribute to the realization and the establishment of the climate agreement? And basically what we, um, what we did there is um, really focusing on the role and the impact that the financial sector has on the climate. So not only look at, and it's really important, eh? so we'll dive more into that later also in our session. It's really important to look at the, the financial uh, risks of climate, but it's evenly important to look at what's the impact of the financial sector on what is happening uh, with our climate issue. And how can the financial sector contribute to um, uh, 
to also from the financial point of view, so from the, the carbon financed, that that is decreasing indeed in line with the Paris uh, goals. And that is where we took the in initiative, uh, where we contacted our Minister of Finance uh, in the Netherlands to join the group of financial sector players, so banks, um, asset managers, uh, insurance companies and pension funds together and we uh, united um, more over than over 80 percent of the total market active in the Netherlands to really disc to really study what is our impact as the financial sector on climate change um, uh, how do we measure and also report to the outside uh, uh, world uh, to make it known what our impact is what is our carbon footprint and also to set, um, you already mentioned that science-based targets, not only for the corporates, but also from the view of the financial sector. What are our targets? What impact do we want to reach with every um, uh, dollar, with every uh, euro, whatever invested um, in um, the, the climate uh, to, um, to, to be in line with the, the Paris goals? And, uh, I can tell a little bit more later on about this initiative sure. with the uh, with the minister. Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you, Itzka. Uh, uh, that was uh, really helpful. Uh, moving on to our uh, next panelist, uh, Marcus Wimmer. Um, Marcus, um, you know, as one of the oldest and largest banks in the world, uh, especially given the size of the bank's operations <laughs> here in India, also. Um, you know, it would be great to hear from you about some of your work uh, with regards to ERM, uh, as well as how climate risk mainstreaming is being considered by debt providers globally, and what are some of the major initiatives uh, in this regard, at least from your perspective. Yeah, many thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Markus Wimmer. I work for Standard Chartered Bank in Germany, where we currently prepare for the Brexit transition, which is due in now less than two months. Um, SCB AG is the subsidiary, and we are part, of course, of Standard Chartered Group. And as some of you might know, Standard Chartered Group operates um, more than 100 branches in India in more than 40 cities. So, um, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, these are our, we call it footprint markets, but we have, uh, of course, operations globally where we serve our clients. And in this context, so I'm working in enterprise risk management. I look on, on the risks for SCB AG. And, uh, but in the broader context, it's of course very important to uh, track what is currently going on with regards to climate risk, but also with regards to other environmental risks like uh, zoonotic pandemics, like the corona pandemic. Um, and we have pollution risk, we have the loss of biodiversity. And uh, when you listen and uh, yeah, track what the experts, the scientists say, that is, that is all very much interlinked. And uh, when you look on the risks, what I do, um, they are not only credit risk, market risk, operational risk, or liquidity risk, there's no this new risk types, climate risk, embedded in ESG or in environmental risks. And uh, even if we have no level playing field regarding the uh, regulation, I think it makes sense to uh, talk about this topic more deeply in almost all uh, committees because it will affect the way how we do business. It will affect supply chains. It will affect... Uh, uh, GDP growth rates for all countries and climate risks are affecting all countries and all uh, industries simultaneously, but asymmetrically as uh, the current uh, Corona pandemic does. So it's a very important topic. We need to uh, increase the awareness that it's a real risk, which is um, already, which is now accelerating. And we see it in India. We see, we have seen it in California with the wildfires. We see it almost everywhere that uh, the extreme weather events have intensified and the frequency is now higher. And uh, when you listen to the scientists, they all predict that uh, the climate change will accelerate even more in the upcoming decade. 
And in this context, uh, we need to get ready. We need to increase, increase the robustness and resilience of our business models, of our portfolios, and uh, for the industry companies of these supply chains. And in this context, we need to have a very open dialogue. We need to share the insights we have, and uh, we need to yeah, take uh, this team approach and uh, fight climate change together. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, and I completely agree with you today. Uh, uh, you know, uh, climate risk is something which is quite global and we've, we've seen evidence globally and uh, the scientists have been telling us about it uh, from for a while now. And, and this is something which like loss of biodiversity, zoonotic disease risk uh, uh, does affect all industries, but quite asymmetrically and and that is something which uh you know we as a, a larger group of financial institutions and those supporting and working with financial institutions really need to take uh, cognizance of um my final panelist today is dr alok mishra um, ceo of in india um dr mishra i know that the concept of climate risk is still very very new and in in india at least and uh, in many cases, still quite unheard of. Um, maybe you could start off uh, uh, by telling us some of the about your work at Emkin India and uh, what, in your opinion, is the most critical element or consideration for uh, uh, microfinance institutions, especially to pro if one is to try and promote climate risk mainstreaming uh, in uh, MFIs. Am I audible clearly? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Pusta. Uh, so, briefly, I would describe the first the work of MFIN and what MFIN is, and then I will talk about climate and uh, how it relates to microfinance and what are we trying to do with it. And later on, when we get back, uh, I will detail uh, the things and some of my global experiences working on climate and microfinance also, I will talk about. So Microfinance Institu Institutions Network is an industry body of microfinance institutions set up in 2010, 2009. And it is in 2014, it was made a self-regulatory organization by Reserve Bank of India. And basically, if I have to talk about our work, our work is divided into three main verticals. The first vertical is about policy advocacy and ecosystem building. And that includes not only MFIs, but also those who are active in the financial inclusion space, like small finance banks, banks, business correspondents. So it is basically an umbrella body for, for policy advocacy and building up a robust ecosystem for all the players, financial players, active in the financial inclusion space. The second part of uh, as the, being an SRO or self-regulatory -reg uh, organization is the work of SRO. So as you all know, the central bank has got uh, a set of guidelines for microfinance institutions to follow. And on top of it, as an industry organization, we have volunteered for some additional codes, which we call as industry code of conduct. So the SRO's work is uh, to monitor adherence to these regulatory principles and the code of conduct and inform members that where are you lacking and what you need to do to come up to that. And the third part is dealing with the field challenges, uh, which we call as state initiatives work. Uh, India being a large country in various parts of uh, various states, uh, we have our state unit uh, persons who deal with local challenges, local disturbances, uh, local issues and all that. So these are the three main areas of work and they are all supplemented by a corporate uh, communications wing. So this is about MFIN. And on the climate uh, risk part of it, I would say that as we deal with financial inclusion space and our primary members are NBFC microfinance institutions, NBFC MFIs, and whether we, even if we expand the horizon to include small finance banks and universal banks active in this financial inclusion space, the clientele with which they are dealing are very poor. Almost, uh, if you look at the segmentation of the population, 
uh, we, I would say them just crossing very poor and going to the level of economically active. Poor. That is the sector which microfinance lends to. They are active in some of the other economic forms, but uh, not destitute, but economically active poor. And for them, it takes generations, uh, so not I would say generation, I would say cycles of loan uh, and credit cycle and other support services to come out and move incrementally a little up on that ladder. And in this, we have seen in our experience that uh, when such events strike, for example, cyclone, last year we had a cyclone in Odisha, uh, floods is a recurrent, uh, recurrent problem uh, in India. Uh, when that happens, or for example, when Gujarat earthquake had happened, or, or uh, excess rainfall happens, uh, all these things lead to such an economic shock. Uh, and these clients, which is supposed eight, eight or nine years, they have been working with microfinance institutions, and they were gradually able to raise their income standard. They were getting a better off. Maybe from when they started, they were having a, they were at dollar three or dollar four per capita income, but they had moved to dollar eight or something, and suddenly these shocks happen and they are back in debt and all their income potential and income earning capacity goes. So that is very vital to us. Uh, the whole concept of climate uh, uh, mainstreaming climate into it and how to mitigate that risk. And unfortunately, uh, if you see the uh, societal pattern and economic uh, distribution, our clients, the way they, their economic activities are so, so, so tiny uh, in the economic scale sort of a thing, that their contribution to aggravating climate risk could be minimal, I would say, or at best, uh, you can even say negligible, not much. But the brunt of these climate risk which they face is enormous. Uh, while a person with some assets and uh, uh, holding capacity can get off with such socks better. So there is a double whammy. Uh, not only they are not, they are the lower contributor, but the impact is the highest on them. And the whole portfolio goes on. So it has been on our radar for quite, quite some time. And every certain things like floods, as I said, in Eastern parts of India and in Bihar, Assam, uh, in parts of Bengal also, they are recurrent phenomena. Every year they happen and that destroys. So we have been trying to see ways how to mitigate risk. And uh, while trying to do so, we have to be conscious of the fact that one, the financial services to these clients uh, operates under a very tightly regulated regime, uh, wherein passing on any cost uh, also will have to be seen whether it passes the regulatory test or not. And second is, trying to build some sort of a financial structure into uh, protecting them has a cost for the client and their capacity to bear that additional cost also has to be seen. But given those constraints also, we are trying our level best and I will detail it later that how, what are the steps we are baby steps you can say so, but that baby steps has also taken us two years of work uh, to get into it. And uh, I'm happy to say that right now, when I'm speaking to you in the other room uh, in the office, my colleagues are on call with ADB on a uh, NatCat insurance product, which I will talk in detail about it, that how do we pilot it. So summarily, uh, into summing up, I would say very important to us, uh, but how do we deal with it? There are open issues to it. And in the next round of it, uh, I will talk about what we are doing and what more we can be done. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Mishra. And I think uh, you've uh, touched on a very, very important point uh, uh, when it comes to finance in India, especially when we talk about uh, microfinance that, and finance from a financial inclusion that you know, you're, you're often serving clients who are extremely poor, um, economically active poor, as you, as you said, but how these extreme weather phenomenon uh, cause them uh, economic shocks and, and uh, it is quite disproportionate on them in the sense that uh, while their impact on the climate is absolutely minimal, uh, the uh, impact of climate change uh, on them, their livelihoods and their lives is uh, probably the most or the maximum uh, amongst uh, you know members of society. Uh, completely agree with you uh, there. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, moving back uh, to uh, Itzka, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, and taking the discussion forward. Uh, it's got, if I may come back to you uh, uh, and with maybe a little bit more specific questions now. Um, so how has thinking around climate uh, risk evolved at Triodos? And how are you now addressing this risk and opportunity? Uh, and uh, what, in your opinion, are some of the major challenges that you have come across in this journey of climate risk? And, and uh, how have you uh, addressed Hello. them? Uh, hey. I heard somebody speaking. Um, no, no, I think there was some confusion, so I muted uh, Alok, sir. Mustafa, you can continue. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, over, over to it's guy. Do you want me to repeat? Or, or, or... Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so it, it's basically um, would love to know more about, you know, how uh, thinking around climate risk has evolved at Triodos. Uh, uh, I know you spoke about uh, the climate agreement in Netherlands and, and how uh, you worked on how financial institutions can contribute to the, the realization of the climate agreement in Netherlands. Um, but within Triodos itself, uh, how has this thinking around climate risk evolved? Uh, and how are you addressing this risk and the opportunity which comes along with it? And what in your opinion have been some of the major challenges that you have uh, come across in this journey uh, with regards to climate risk? And, and if you can share some of the things that you've done to address those challenges. Um, uh, I, I do know that there was a little bit of co uh, context on, on you speaking about uh, uh, you know, decreasing the, the carbon impact of your uh, portfolio in general. And in, in climate risk terms, that's what we would call transition risk. And, and how do you mitigate transition risk? Uh, but but if, of course, if you have any other experience uh, with regards to physical risks as well, uh, that would also be helpful. It would be great to hear that as well. So okay. over to you, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Well, yes, as I explained how uh, climate risk evolved within our company, um, we were, uh, when we were founded, um, uh, uh, the energy and the energy transition and climate issues were already uh, one of our major topics and areas of attention. And right from the start, so 40 years ago, we really started, we, we saw also huge opportunities in the more renewables, the sustainable uh, ways of um, uh, producing uh, uh, electricity. So we were one of the, 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 the banks that really started with financing uh, wind energy later on, solar energy, also small hydro energy, etc. So for us, we see it actually as a huge opportunity, but it all started from a risk point of view because we were convinced and still are convinced that the fossil fuel sector in the end, also from a fiduciary point of view, a fiduciary duty point of view, uh, will be and are already becoming the stranded assets uh, in a rather near uh, future. You see a lot of things already moving and changing uh, there. So, um, so right from the beginning, we were focused on the renewable energy area. And well, we can see what this offers us now, because as a group, as Triodos Bank Group, we are now already for five years leading the clean energy um, tables, um, the clean energy league tables of the most active player in uh, structuring renewable energy deals not in terms of volume, because we are a relatively small uh, uh, a bank group, if you look at the, the, the big banks uh, worldwide, but in terms of um, number of deals. And we really f believe that um, there is a big component also of decentralized uh, projects. So we really also want to focus the more smaller and medium-sized projects because energy on the one hand, um, is moving into really large scale projects, but at the same time also moving into more decentralized eh? and, and decentralized um, solving of the energy 
um, uh, production, but also the, the energy delivery and the energy use nearer to the clients is really important. So that's why we also focus on the, the small and medium sized uh, projects. So actually, um, we saw more opportunities, I would say, than challenges. And for us also where we uh, invest, for example, in um, uh, financial uh, inclusion. So in microfinance institution, the sustainability focus of the banks and also in the governance is an important topic that we discuss before we put our private equity uh, that, was, that was, is entrusted by our investors into a microfinance uh, institutions. And the sustainability focus is a real important uh, topic in our um, shareholderships and also board seats uh, if we, if we uh, uh, fulfill them. Um, then maybe something more about uh, mitigation, this uh, uh, transition risk and also really this, this focus of decrease of the carbon footprint of the financial institutions. We see also because we have a lot of retail investors that invest in our um, uh, funds. Um, uh, so over half is uh, really retail uh, uh, investors next to professional and institutional investors. Uh, and these retail investors really invest in us to you know, uh, come to this uh, decrease um, in uh, uh, carbon uh, carbon footprints and really uh, support the, the pioneers in the, 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 the energy uh, sector. Um, but that's maybe on what we what we finance uh, the, the projects that we finance, but where we want to change the financial sector, that's this experience as I uh, started about in um, the, the climate agreement. Um, basically, um, what we said is yes, you can, and we have to see what the, the corporate sector is doing, uh, but we also have to cooperate with um, the government, with the regulatory body, with the Ministry of Finance in this case, and he also embraced it. The ministry also embraced really this initiative to, to really start measuring and disclosing uh, the carbon footprint of the whole financial industry uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and um, so the minister embraced it um, and uh, we have an independent uh, chair um, who is uh, guiding us um, in, the, in the coming years in this, uh, in this uh, uh, project. And the, um, the carbon footprint, the measure, measuring will also be uh, published and uh, one of the, 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 the top uh, auditors uh, companies will also review uh, that statement. So we'll also really give a stamp that it's rightly calculated because it's rather difficult if you talk about private equity and private debt and where to get the data uh, uh, from and data right. So we really also seek guidance and help um, to, to, to set the right standards and get the right uh, uh, data. So the, ch and the challenge in this whole uh, discussion, I would say, was not so much to get the minister involved. He was really quite supportive of it, but it was also a matter of trust among the financial institutions um, because there was a lot of fear that it would be seen as bashing um, those financial institutions that currently have still a big exposure in the fossil fuel uh, sector. Um, but um, it's basically not about that. Uh, it's and because then we maybe as traders would show off uh, perfectly dark green um, uh, because we invest in in the in the pioneers. But that's that's not what the whole idea behind it. It's really about uh, uh, to to cooperate and to make visible what our impact is and to attract those who invest in our financial institutions. To, to really make that movement uh, uh, with us and to look at, uh, well, what, how does that portfolio look like and where do we need to go to be in line with the, with the Paris calls? So, because we can, we can adapt to the situation, we can adapt to climate change, but first and foremost, we should also really yeah, help ourselves and stimulate the financial sector to, um, to, um, to really mitigate uh, climate change.
Right, right. Uh, thank you so much, and and, and I, I completely uh, uh, agree with you. Uh, I, I think the points which you made on starting off from you know, risk point of view and knowing that fossil assets would get stranded, seeing more opportunities than challenges, and uh, you know even bring, bringing the Minister of Finance uh, on board and, and having his buy-in, I, I think these are very uh, crucial steps that you've been able to take uh, or even have as part of your investment thesis, if I can call, use the term very broadly and generally. Uh, and, and I think uh, these are really important. And I also think you've touched upon a very important point on uh, the data uh, on measuring, uh, you know, the climate impact of your investments and the impact of climate on your investments. And, and um, so I think these are all relevant. And I think, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it's great to learn from you uh, on, on these. And, and I think it's about time maybe Indian financial institutions, at least, you know, the large ones who can or, uh, or the ones who have much more flexibility and can uh, start thinking about matters in, in this way. Uh, this also gives me a great segue to uh, Marcus and the questions I have for uh, him. Uh, so thank you, Itzka. Uh, and, uh, 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 oh, you know, coming over to you, Marcus, uh, you know, it would be great to hear about your experience with the broader concept of climate risk. And in particular, what kind of frameworks are uh, financial institutions such as yours considering for mainstreaming the, the climate risk at an investment or an enterprise level? Uh, what are the specific parameters that you are considering, you know, coming from the ERM perspective? Uh, and what kind of support have you needed from uh, the ecosystem or still require from the uh, ecosystem uh, that you feel can help you promote greater awareness, but also uh, implement uh, 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 the measurement of climate risk uh, uh, into your work uh, much more smoothly. Um, so uh, over to you, uh, Marcus. Yeah, so many thanks for this uh, question. Um, as all of you know, when you work in a bank, you are highly dependent on your local regulator. And in this context, uh, we are currently waiting here in Germany for some more regulatory guidance on how we should implement climate risk into our risk management framework. That is one component. Uh, the second component is, of course, we belong to Standard Chartered Group and on a group level, we already have started to roll out this climate risk framework. So there's always this uh, challenge between group uh, requirements and uh, local regulatory re requirements. What I can say based on my experience, um, there are a couple of really good uh, platforms and initiatives and uh, also documents available which can help everyone to uh, get up to speed regarding climate risk management. Um, in this context, I would uh, like to refer to the network of greening the financial system. Uh, that's basically a club of uh, supervisors and regulators, and um, they have a very good uh, organized download platform where you can access very useful uh, documents for your environmental risk assessments. And, uh, in this context, there's also something going on in the United States that's basically very important, uh, especially in this week where we have the presidential election. So there, the uh, Commodity Future Trading Commission has recently launched, launched their requirements uh, for banks in the US. So it's uh, So a lot of things are currently going on regarding regulation and also regarding initiatives. Next year, we have the COP26 event, highly likely happening. Um, so it was postponed due to the uh, COVID situation, but hopefully we will have it next week. And that's uh, next year, sorry, that's uh, an important conference. And uh, in this context, decision makers, uh, governments, companies, they will talk about what they can do to fight climate change because it will ultimately 
affect everyone. So no government, no company, no region will be excluded because once the emissions are basically in the air, I'm not talking only about carbon emissions, there are a couple of others, uh, there are no boundaries uh, in the atmosphere and uh, the emissions which are released in one country can lead to extreme weather events in another country very far off. So uh, it's important that we, um, as a bank, that we play an active role and support our clients because they need to upgrade their infrastructure, their buildings, their machines. And uh, whenever um, we can provide sustainable finance solutions, we are happy to help from a bank point of view. Uh, because we need to serve our clients and we need to enable them to manage this transition very actively and um, within our risk management uh, world we need to of course uh, upgrade our governance we need to include climate risk into the existing uh, risk management uh, policies mechanisms frameworks um, to make sure that we also have the data and the uh, possibility to make our decisions uh, based also on risk related, uh, sorry, on climate risk related aspects. And um, I think we will see a lot of progress in the upcoming years. Uh, of course, the outcome of the presidential election in the US um, is important. So uh, I don't want to uh, promote any of the candidates, but I think everyone is aware that uh, one candidate is. Uh, pushing back regarding climate change. Uh, and one uh, candidate is very supportive and has already uh, introduced his uh, green agenda. So um, I think it's very important to look also on the election outcome. And uh, to um, another point, which is important is that uh, it should not, climate risk should not be treated in isolation because when we talk about transition risks, there are a couple of other macro themes which are equally important, like uh, the trade war going on between the US and uh, China, just as one example. Um, and there are a couple of others. We have Brexit here in Europe happening in almost uh, two months. And uh, we are currently in the Corona pandemic situation. So the environment, the economy is very challenging currently. And we need to find uh, smart solutions together with our clients and with the other stakeholders to, um, yeah, to make sure that we uh, make the best decisions, not only short-term decisions, but also long-term decisions, because in the end, we want to uh, breathe clean air and we want to uh, enjoy our life outside. And uh, in this context, it's very important uh, to uh, take climate risk very seriously, not only from a regulatory point of view, but really from a practical point of view. Sure, thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, and again, um, completely in agreement with you on, uh, uh, you know, climate risk uh, uh, be, should not be taken in isolation. Uh, it, it needs to be taken, uh, with, you know, with, with the context of all other risks that are there. Um, there is definitely, uh, uh, you know, a need to work with clients and, and help them upgrade their infrastructure, their buildings, the machinery uh, to sort of mitigate the risk of climate change and how it will affect them. Uh, but also more in general, uh, uh, you know, like you said, it's a practical consideration. It's no longer just about regulatory issues. Um, it is a practical consideration. Um, you brought up the point on uh, NGFS and uh, you know uh, action or rather risk measurement being somewhat also dependent on uh, local regulatory uh, regimes, and I think that that is a very important context for India, which uh, uh, sort of takes me to the next bit on this uh, to Dr. Mishra. Uh, especially given that India, despite being such a large economy and being such a large country, uh, uh, really doesn't have any sort of mem membership with the NGFS uh, when most of, uh, you know, Europe, uh, most of America's uh, uh, and different parts of Asia and South Asia uh, have some form of membership with the NGFS. Um, 
and, and even our regulator or the financial sector regulators here uh, have not given us too much of guidance with regards to uh, climate risk and its me measurement. Um, Dr. Mishra, uh, if I may ask you, um, you know, taking maybe a slightly more macro perspective uh, on, on debt, but of, of course, you know, having some reference to microfinance also, uh, uh, what has your experience been with climate risk? Uh, and, and having heard our other panelists, um, uh, what are the challenges that you foresee from both a policy and a re or a regulatory angle, as well as an implementation uh, perspective in mainstreaming climate risk in financial institutions in India? Uh, would love to hear your perspective on, on this, as well as uh, about some of the work which you were referring to earlier with, with ADB and, and other work that you've done on climate risk. Um, so over to you, Dr. Mishra. Okay, thank you. So on the policy front, I will start uh, because you have asked two broad questions and one is on the specific work which we are doing and the second is on the policy front. Well, uh, being a student of uh, global development discourse, I am a firm believer that uh, ultimately it is the implementation at the ground level which is more material. Uh, we can have uh, starting from our sustainability summit in late 1970s where Bro Harlem Brundtland gave the slogan of uh, sustainability and definition of sustainability. We have seen the global community create so many principles, whether it is MDG or SDG or green principles. Last year, we saw the COP discussions and all that. Those mechanics will continue. I, uh, I feel that uh, while they are important, uh, they are important to enhance global understanding and uh, what should I say, global acceptability at the policy front that climate risk, uh, climate change is real. But the proof of the pudding lies in the implementation. And that is where the challenge is. Uh, uh, because you can uh, sign any number of protocols, any number of treaties, as uh, one of my colleague uh, Lulof was talking about, exclusion list, uh, IFC, while funding... Uh, any organization will say that you will abide by the exclusion list, uh, IFC mandated exclusion list. Now, every, that's a tick box approach. And nobody is going to check in the field. Nobody is monitoring it. Nobody has internalized it. So I, I, coming from a practitioner side, I would say the, the policy prescriptions have to be kept simple and implementable. Uh, for example, I would just give an example in... Uh, I worked with World Bank in Bangladesh on mainstreaming uh, climate risk. Uh, it was not actually climate risk, but it was more on the green side of it. But both of them have uh, quite a little bit of synergies. And, and that was for microfinance. So we first tried with so much of solutions, what can be practical, what cannot be practical, how do you do at the ground level? So finally, after a lot of deliberations, and those deliberations, you need to have patience also. Because you devise a solution, you go to the field, you talk to the stakeholders, the client, and then you see it doesn't work. Uh, the field officer of the financial institution has to agree to it. The end the client has to agree to it and all that. You have to build proper incentives around it. So finally, what we built was, and it is, uh, I have not uh, gone there after since last one and a half years, but initial stages I was there. The way we did was that the at the start of each loan cycle, whatever activity you're doing, whether it is small scale aquaculture or it is agriculture or it is uh, saw cutting or it is plumbing or whatever work you're doing, we had a basic standard checklist and we divided it into three categories. One was green, where you are doing uh, zero, what you could say climate risk. Then there was orange, then there was brown and then red. And we divided indicators into it that if uh, agri small scale agriculture or paddy cultivation is done as per these, at least these basic protocols are followed, you are under green or you are blue or orange. And at each loan cycle, when I was giving, I would the loan officer will go and assess that client and livelihood and take where you are. And later on, when this uh, loan is finished and second loan cycle starts at the time of sanction, you have to incrementally monitor a person who, who moves one channel up 
say I was in red, but I moved to brown in the next cycle by improving some of the practices. And you have to tell solutions to them also, handhold to them also, get certain incentives, like maybe uh, a higher size loan, which he was earlier denied, or a slightly one or two percentage points lesser interest rate. So those incentives were also built in. And it was starting to work well because uh, these are micro things, but if you can implement it in a practical and robust manner, that is the most important thing. Uh, but sometimes it becomes difficult because it needs a lot of capacity building for loan officers, for field officers to be trained on all these things. And the uh, moment your eyesight is off, uh, because even in the initial six months I could see in Bangladesh, moment our monitoring and surveillance and field visits stopped, uh, it again converted into a checklist sort of an approach. So how to internalize it and how to see that this, uh, this whole thing can not only uh, uh, affect our business model, but also threaten human survival. That has to be internalized and told in a very powerful manner so that people do it voluntarily. Like right now, uh, what we are going through in COVID times, people have to be self-told that why wearing mask and maintaining distance is important. If you simply want it as a regulatory and policy prescription, it doesn't work. So same thing uh, in climate risk also has to be done at the implementation level. And on the EMFIN side, uh, so we said, while well, these things will might take time and uh, we do not have that uh, framework right now in the place, at least uh, what we can do is think of some financial structured product which can help the clients. Uh, suppose there is a flood, a seasonal flood of a month or so, and the client is unable to pay, say, one installment or two installment or three monthly installments, or there is a drought, uh, the cropping cycle is affected, two, three EMIC is not, he or she is not able to pay, how to make them come out of it. So we have been working with uh, Swiss Ray, the global uh, reinsurer, and uh, a local insurance company. And we tried to work out a product uh, which we have called is as NATCAT or Natural Calamity Insurance Product. And which at present covers four types of uh, natural calamity. One is drought, the second is flood, cyclone and earthquake. Initially, we have started with this. And luckily, and uh, sorry, and you know that in India, currently none of the insurance companies offer any insurance product on natural disasters. Huh? Well, uh, so we had to convince them that there is a business model. Microfinance in India is serving 60 million clients. So there is volume also, if we can build into it, build a business case around that. It took a lot of time of convincing them and uh, working out the pricing and all that. But the, then how do you convince the regulator? How do you convince uh, Insurance Regulatory Development Authority? So we were in discussion with them, but luckily for us, uh, when we broached this idea, they were very open to it. And they said that we are opening up uh, like in other financial services. ADA is insurance regulator, is, has also, as you know, opened up a regulatory sandbox that whatever innovations have to come in, they can be filed in and they can be pilot tested. So this October, last October 15th, the insurance company with us has filed this insurance product, which we call as NATCAT product uh, for regulatory approval in the regulatory sandbox window of ADA. If it comes through, uh, what we are trying to do is, uh, is that at a lower premium, trying to cover the client against three or four monthly installments in case these events happen. So there are three, four things like with each of this drought, flood, cyclone, earthquake, uh, because they have to be at a, a very local level. So in India, we have decided it to be at a gram panchayat level or at uh, in some cases like an earthquake at a block level. And, and then we also have to decide at what intensity the cover will uh, kick in. So based on historical events, we have built that in. Pricing has also been decided. Uh, and what, uh, what will determine the success of it is that how do we convince the clients to take that? Because as you know, in the current regulatory prescription of India, you cannot bundle any insurance with your credit product. It has to be voluntarily adopted by the client. To convince a client uh, who has got 700 rupees of monthly installment and 25,000 rupees of loan, to pay 300 or 400 to cover herself for natural calamities of these four types, that might itself be tough. 
because normally in uh, these types of products uh, just sorry? to give you a time check uh, uh, okay sorry oh sorry i i never sorry no 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 you, sorry you can about conclude it. Uh, uh, two minutes to conclude okay yeah so so that will be another challenge uh, because the pricing becomes very important because microfinance in india operates on a very tiny margin and even uh, 100 rupees or one and a half dollars or two dollars here and there uh, to the client makes a difference and the regulator is very uh, sensitive about pricing so we will come to that uh, but just to tell you that we have made a beginning with this uh, product and when i was referring to the call with adb adb is uh, climate risk facility is uh, very what should i say got interested about it they came to know from somewhere and they have been saying that they will support us in the pilot in india and once it is successful we'll take it across to other southeast asian countries so i will stop here in the interest of time thank you so much i, I think um, honestly this whole thing which you've spoken about the uh, natcat insurance product the the challenges that you're facing with its rollout i, I could probably talk hours about that product in your experience with you uh, just there um uh, unfortunately i have to stop you for uh, time considerations no um coming to uh, uh the questions from the audience and, and and the participants uh of the webinar um there are a couple of questions uh from uh the audience um i think they're specific to some of the panelists um it's uh, there's a question specifically for itska uh and that is uh it's called what are the processes that are being used to collect data uh at an investi level to understand the impact of climate risks uh especially when we are considering things such as payback and irr uh so has there been any thought around this or, or is this something that you're still uh, developing and, and if so uh uh what has been your experience with this yes so i can't see the question in the chat is that right i am i'm, I'm not sure if you can see the question in in the chat mm -hmm. uh, uh I, i'll just repeat the question for you so yes please uh so basically the question is around uh what processes or or how are you collecting data uh at an investi level or at a project uh level yep. to understand the impact of climate risk and yeah uh, are you being able to factor that in into payback and irr considerations yeah okay um so far, um, we have been looking mostly at the carbon footprint of our investments. So not so much on the climate risk of the investments, but mainly at the carbon footprint. And that data of all data is more or less relatively well available because basically you get to uh, CO2 uh, uh, emissions um, uh, prevented. And usually that's something where you more or less you have some uh, standards uh, uh, around. And um, we've had a, a big uh, discussion or a big debate in the Netherlands um, uh, around the methodology, whether we have, for example, if we are a co-financier or a co-investor, whether we uh, present or report on the total um, carbon footprint decreased or our part of the financing so the on based on the attribution uh, because uh, and we've chosen the latter uh, because otherwise you would double count uh, the impact of the of the financial sector so that's a, a discussion uh, uh, we had however if you look more broadly also to to other sectors the agri sector which has also quite a carbon footprint but there co2 avoided emissions and that type of data is not really easily uh, available and there we work with parties who uh, have uh, uh, kind of uh, more also more average um, um, uh, targets available in the market 
uh, that you apply to your um, uh, your portfolio uh, where you invest uh, in. So for uh, let's say for um, uh, cattle breeding or uh, and whether that's organic or not, uh, etc. So you build yourself on those that data, which is which is more or less um, available. Um, so far, um, we have not uh, factored it in in the um, in the in the in the pricing so much. Although, if a project is um, um has a low um uh, a low climate risk that generally um lowers the risk of the investment and hence your the 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 pricing of your investment or your your requirements um uh, for equity um uh, return can uh can be um how to say that can be adapted uh, so uh, in that sense, um, but we um, have not directly uh, factored it in also because once more, we really focus on those investments that are already taking this into uh, consideration. Right, right. Thank you so much. And, and I think uh, it's a great step to probably start with carbon footprinting, uh, I, I think transition risk which covers carbon footprinting probably is the most well understood of all climate risks, at least currently across uh, uh, the world amongst financial institutions. Financial institutions have had some sort of legacy work uh, with climate uh, risk in terms of at least carbon foot footprinting. So I, I, and I suppose that would be easier um, and and I, I take your point well in the sense that, you know, if a project has low climate risk, uh, that means the overall risk of the project does come down and, and then automatically uh, returns expectations from them, uh, those projects would then automatically get uh, tempered. Um, I, I am taking maybe the same question which I had for you forward to uh, Marcus and, and, and seeing this from a more ERM uh, perspective as well. Uh, uh, Marcus, has your experience been uh, any different, especially, you know, uh, uh, focusing more on the physical risk side of uh, climate risk, uh, I, I believe, uh, uh, you know, it, it's because uh, response does cover the carbon footprint and the and the transition risk bit uh, fairly well. But but uh, from a physical risk aspect, uh, how has your experience been? What are the challenges that uh, you you have been facing in incorporating it within the whole ERM framework? Yeah, many thanks for this question. It's a very good one. I would say that insurance companies they have a an advantage because they are dealing with physical risks for decades and they have uh, very good models for simulating climate and uh, climate risk events and um, when you look deeper on these climate or extreme weather events you uh, realize that you have basically five factors which drive these physical risk uh, risks or extreme weather events and that is temperature wind you have rain, you have the seasons of the year, and you have, of course, topographic characteristics. And they all together, um, they need to be considered when you want to create your models for physical risks. And uh, even if you look on one country, and let's take uh, the United States as an example, just uh, just once. Um, you have we have seen uh, seen this in the press that uh, we have we have they have experienced uh, these extreme severe wildfires uh, in California and they have also experienced these hurricanes um, like India did with the uh, typhoons and um, everything happens simultaneously and um, so even if you look on one country it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the climate risk exposure is uh, the same in every uh, region of the country so I think uh, getting very granular data is uh, important. And uh, when I then look on what's currently happening in science, I think with 
new satellite technologies um, which are currently launched into orbit, it will hopefully get uh, easier to um, um, yeah, to calculate, to make these calculations because the data availability will be increased. And uh, I think uh, that could help us to develop uh, more precise and more granular models for the physical risks. And in addition, we also need to, uh, of course, uh, talk about transition risks because uh, when we have, let's say, policy changes, we have price movements, we have customer behavior changes, these are all transition risks caused by climate change and um, they're of course very important when you want to uh, develop a very successful or sustainable business model or when you want to make your portfolio as resilient as possible and um, so we as banks uh, need to learn more about uh, how to measure and calculate climate risks so the physical risks as well as uh, of course the transition risks and I think we shouldn't wait for um, very precise regulatory guidance from our home regulators. We should start now and uh, sit together in the boardroom, sit together in the most relevant risk meetings and uh, put climate risk on the agenda because every institution has its own vulnerabilities regarding uh, climate risks. And um, in this context, it's, I think, very important for every decision maker, especially when you work in risk, that you uh, consider all these outside risks because uh, you need to make uh, better decisions or you want to improve your decision making. And in this context, even without precise local regulation, it's very good to uh, consider climate risk as an important factor for decision making. And then, of course, you can talk about simulation, stress testing, uh, scenario analysis, etc. But um, ultimately, it's I think the starting point is really putting this topic on the agenda uh, of the board meeting and the uh, enterprise risk committee meeting in your company because um, that will drive the uh, other discussions on budget for IT upgrades, uh, budget for additional FTEs which have a scientific background and understand the language uh, of science regarding climate risk and um, yeah that would be my recommendation. Thank you Marcus. Uh so actually, I have another question here for you, but I'm going to flip it. The question currently mm -hmm. says, uh, what policy interventions may be required in emerging economies for the mainstreaming of climate risks? Uh, but uh, at this point, maybe uh, I'll flip this question over based on uh, your response that, uh, you know, we, we really need to start having these conversations within the boardroom, uh, within the ERM meetings and, and, and you know, uh, have this demand for adequate budgets or, or technology which will allow us to work and, and assess climate risk uh, within our portfolios and investment decision making better. Do mm -hmm. you, uh, uh, and also, you know, taking into account what uh, Dr. Mishra had said that, you know, it's great to have policies, but it is far more important to implement them well right up to the ground level. Uh, and capacities there are going to be very important. Uh, do you feel that, uh, you know, there is a need for more of a bottom up sort of approach when we talk about climate risk regulations and uh, in the sense that we need the, the individual uh, financial <clears throat> institutions mm -hmm. to first recognize this internally, uh, understand and accept that yes, this is a risk which we need to uh, uh, consider then maybe come together as groups or small groups or large groups use industry bodies of these financial institutions to move and speak to the regulators and say hey this is a risk and this is the kind of regulation we need to help with this risk uh, or do you see this being more of a collaborative effort in both top down and bottom up because uh, like like it's said in her experience with, with uh, the Ministry of Finance in, in the Netherlands. It was the minister who was quite uh, on board with, with uh, disclosures with regards to some aspects of climate risk. Mm -hmm. But there was also a fear that if it becomes too top down, uh, there will be uh, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, backlash from some of the investors who have traditionally had uh, more risky investments with regards uh, to climate. 
Yeah, very good question. So many things. So I am promoting something which I call a three-dimensional dialogue because ideally we don't have just the top-down or the bottom-up dialogue. We talk also across functions, across regions, across industries, and across professions about this uh, topic because uh, it's very complex and uh, it's very challenging for us working in banks to um, to make the best uh, decisions regarding the uh, future. So currently it's on the uh, horizon as a topic. It's not new, but now there's a lot of management attention and media attention on climate risk because of the extreme weather events which we have seen this year and uh, because of also some very important uh, policy changes like uh, firstly the EU uh, has launched uh, or promoted its uh, very ambitious climate goals. China did the same, very important, with their climate agenda. And then also California uh, announced uh, their climate goals for California. And other regions will follow. And uh, in this context, there's a lot of uh, dynamic in the market uh, regarding policy measures. We see a lot of initiatives, very uh, big investors are now pushing very hard for disclosures and uh, for more ESG implementation. And um, so it's, it's a complex topic. And ideally, we uh, keep this open dialogue. And um, ideally, we also not only wait for the regulatory guidance, but um, look into other sources we can use. So I'm using LinkedIn as my primarily uh, tool or platform for data gathering and information gathering it's very powerful because um, I have the ability to uh, see what the United Nations uh, are publishing what uh, other regulatory regulators are publishing and many other stakeholders they are all working on uh, this at the moment and um, it's very practical and uh, I think we need pragmatic solutions um, and uh, we need to uh, share the knowledge with, which is already available. And uh, many of these sources, almost every report what, which I see on LinkedIn is uh, free of charge and you can easily download it. And this then helps to also promote this topic internally and to uh, prepare for the boardroom or ERM uh, discussions. And uh, I think that is something what, you, what everyone can easily uh, use and leverage. And uh, yeah, I think, that's the starting point. And then, of course, you need to see where are your vulnerabilities and what is your complexity regarding your business model. Um, and then you need to start uh, fine tuning it and uh, you need to start uh, improving your data management, improving your decision making, your simulations and uh, everything I think is interconnected and uh, it uh, will be a very fascinating and interesting uh, journey. Uh, when we want to implement this in the next years. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. And, and, and uh, I, I completely agree with you. And I think the idea of the, uh, a three-dimensional dialogue as well as uh, I like how you quite innovatively use uh, uh, LinkedIn to, to get data uh, as well. I, I think I'm going to take that up in, in my own uh, personal usage of LinkedIn and, and maybe the others on the uh, 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 you know listening in can. Um, unfortunately, we just have five more minutes uh, in in this session, so not too much more time for uh, more questions. Maybe we can just squeeze in one uh, or two last questions uh, to Dr. Mi to Dr. Mishra, uh, and I will request Dr. Mishra to answer them as quickly as possible, uh, and then we can sum up uh, the session. Um, the questions are uh, more along uh, the lines of uh, what is the way forward for climate risk mainstreaming in India from the current stage in 2020? And what do you think, uh, Dr. Mishra, are some of the critical steps that you think will lead to the mainstreaming of climate risks in uh, India over the next few years, maybe next two, three, four years? And uh, closer to uh, your work, uh, what do you see are the more critical sectors uh, that are serviced by MFI borrowers uh, that are being impacted by climate change? And, and uh, if, uh, if there is any way right now that uh, 
the MFIs can adapt uh, to help these borrowers. Uh, I, I know the second part you've kind of already answered in, in, in uh, or earlier, so maybe you can skip that. Uh, but definitely what are the more critical sectors from you, for your perspective, and definitely what are the steps that we can take as a country to move forward on climate risk and, and its measurement and its uh, understanding. Okay, uh, thank you. You have asked me to be brief, uh, though the questions merit a very longish answer because you talked <laughs> about what is the way forward for climate risk mainstreaming, but I will keep it brief. Uh, uh, so uh, what I see, because uh, in this panel, we are talking about uh, uh, mainly about financing and financial institutions. Uh, that is one piece of it. Uh, uh, but the major things going forward for India as a country, uh, because uh, I am a development banker first and uh, a development economist uh, to boot to that. So I would comment mainly that these are, there are four major areas which India has to work on. Uh, because if we have to work on the climate risk things, which come to my mind, uh, one is that uh, in our urban cities, and these are all policy things, these financial institutions can't solve them. Financial institutions only channelize funds from savers to borrowers. Uh, they can't solve these policy problems. One is the issue of transport, especially in our urban cities. Uh, uh, how, what, how does, what sort of policy choices you make, uh, uh, whether you... Uh, what you can say, incentivize car makers to produce cheap cars and flood your streets with uh, vehicles where it becomes so affordable, uh, or you go on for a rapid transport or a mass transport sort of a thing. That has become a very major issue. And in a city like NC, National Capital Region, we are seeing that. Second is uh, a very clear and, uh, what should I say, implementable action on the mining part of it, which is linked to deforestation. Uh, which is a major reason for uh, climate risk in India uh, on the mining part of it, that how much of uh, GDP you want to create out of mining and how much uh, forest you want to maintain and where will you put an end to it and what will the practices around it. So transportation, mining. Second is usage of fossil fuels. Uh, around fossil fuels, we have made a lot of progress in Solar Alliance and all that, but we need to do more. And the fourth part is uh, relating to the, which comes uh, back to the loops, back to the next question of mine, uh, that is on livelihoods, which are most impacted. And that is agriculture. In that, uh, the work which government has to do, it, I don't have the luxury of time. So a lot of things have to be done on natural resource management uh, under our fertilizer subsidy policy. The land quality has become so degraded because of uh, excessive use of urea or the nitrogen fertilizer. So that soil balance has to be brought in. Drought proofing of soil has to be done. Agriculture extension has to be done. So all these things, uh, because 60% of our population still depends on agriculture. Though it contributes only 15% to GDP, uh, <clears throat> but uh, we have to focus on that and that government has to do. We cannot sigh away from that and shift the responsibility on to financial institutions. Now, coming to the second part of it, uh, I was uh, I was asked uh, that what are the most critical sectors uh, with by microfinance uh, borrowers which are impacted. So there are two. One is uh, that our borrowers are those who are involved in small scale uh, vegetable growing or small scale agriculture or uh, animal husbandry. They, they are the most impacted by these climate events, mainly flooding uh, and drought conditions. And those which are most resilient to it are those involved in trade, like having a small grocery shop or uh, having a, a, what you can say, a flour mill or something like that, which is natural. The more your livelihood is uh, tied uh, to the natural resource context, more you suffer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mishra. Uh, that was very helpful. Um, so uh, given that you know we're, we're at the end of the session, uh, let me first thank the panel here today uh, for your contribution, your time. Uh, this has been an extremely informative session and an uh, extremely enlightening session. Um, I hope that the attendees today have found this discussion useful. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say that you know, uh, from today's discussion, we've learned some very key points. I think uh, at least what I feel some of the key takeaways are, uh, uh, you know, 
one obviously on it is very very important to work uh, on the capacities at ground level uh, we one can create policies uh, but you know simply creating policies is not going to be effective uh, a tick box approach will not work capacity needs to be created at ground level and internalized um, it is also very important that you know financial in institutions themselves they recognize uh, the importance of climate risk and its measurement um, and, and understanding it uh, uh, and they should not just wait for regulators to come in and tell them what to do while regulation is extremely and policy is extremely important uh, the financial institutions themselves uh, need to be proactive uh, because there is going to be a lot of ask from in terms of internal budgeting uh, for technology for uh, capacity building, training, etc., um, and uh, you know, one one needs to get data is also going to be a major challenge. Uh, but with more technology, for which uh, uh, you know, if you ask for the right bu budgets, uh, you can get granular data, uh, which is granular data available now from the newer satellites, etc., uh, and that is going to be very important. But going forward, also uh, one of the key things in understanding climate risk and climate risk is not simply lim limited to physical risk, um, is that carbon footprinting and understanding the carbon footprint of your investments is going to uh, We can't hear you. I think we have some network issues. Now he's yes. back. Hi, yeah. uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, now you're audible. You, oh, we lost you for two seconds, three, four, three, four seconds. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I think it's really important that uh, you know, we have internally within our organizations as financial institutions uh, but also, like Marcus said, it needs to be a more holistic, three-dimensional dialogue. These are complex. Uh, this is a complex issue. Uh, there are not going to be too many simple solutions, and data is going to be extremely uh, important in the way forward. Uh, and finally, before we get to the data, where we try to find the solutions, we need to convince ourselves, just like you know, Theodos has done, uh, to say that yes, this is a challenge. This is uh, uh, this is something important which we need to incorporate uh, into how we think about uh, helping uh, uh, the people that we invest in, people that we give funds to, give loans to. Uh, so, so I think I think that is these three four things are very clear. Um, Having said that, I think uh, finally, I think I would like to thank the panel again uh, for their time uh, and thank IntelliCap and the Avishkar group for host, hosting this session. I will apologize to the attendees whose questions I was not able to ask due to paucity of time. Um, if there are still any questions or queries for any of us in the panel specifically, <clears throat> please, uh, 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 IntelliCap and the summit have set up uh, an excellent way to reach out to us through the platform. Um, uh, and, and of course, please reach out to our colleagues at IntelliCap and uh, if you still can't get through to us, and I'm sure they will try and uh, get your questions answered at the early oh, okay. uh, So thank you so much, Ankit. Uh, uh, and, and thank you so much to the panelists and attendees today. Thank you so much, Pusta. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, hope you will join us for the remaining sessions at Sankalp. Uh, we have exciting lineup of sessions today, tomorrow as well, uh, until uh, we have sessions till Friday. So please do join us for all the sessions and take the maximum benefit out of it. Thank you so much. Thank you.